old covenant. We are not ministering that. He said, we minister the spirit. So when we speak the gospel, what did Jesus say? These words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You can block that grace and that life that comes through the, through the words if you go back under the old covenant and you start to minister commands. That There's no power to transform there. I have to keep saying that. Um, that taking our eyes off Christ, this is the danger. And we take our hearts off the mercy and the grace of God. This is the danger whereby he transformed us in the beginning and he gave us the very life which we now live and we breathe. Um, to return again to the beggarly elements and our minds are drawn down to the earthly, le earthly level. Um, what did Paul say? Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Set your affections on the heavenly things. The Bible clearly says we're ministers of the spirit. We're not ministers of the ministration of death written and engraven on stones. We are a Gentile people selected purely by the mercy and the grace of God not through works we, were we selected and we don't go to works to, to remain selected. And we, as Paul said, are under the law towards Christ and not under the law of Moses. So he, Paul makes a distinction between those that were of the law and those that are without law, but were not without law completely, but were under the law towards Christ, which he calls the law of the Spirit. Our conscience also bearing witness either accusing us or excusing us in the day of the lord jesus christ he said he actually said they are we are a law to ourselves we wouldn't use that term in saying that we are we are actually a law to ourselves but because we have the spirit in us and we become the temple of god we weren't under the law we become a law to ourselves because the spirit the law is written on our hearts the law of the spirit is written on our hearts so we become a law to ourselves and that's not to i don't actually like to really emphasize that because that can be misunderstood and and people can say well that's you know let's not get all proud and i agree it's still about the grace of god but that's been imprinted it's like a signet ring imprinted on our hearts and on on our consciences um <clears throat> Our consciences bearing witness, either accusing or excusing us. Let me go a little bit further because I've just said that. The holiness of God is implanted into us and we behold his glory and our conscience becomes aware of good and evil, as it says in Hebrews. And so we take every thought captive and we start to understand the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Let me hold up there. Under the old law, it wasn't you didn't understand evil that way. Under the old law, you understood evil through the Ten Commandments, for instance, and the other, uh, other certain moral commandments under the law. That's how you understood whether you're doing something wrong. Under the New Covenant, we don't understand. We don't go to a, to, to a book to find out whether we're doing something wrong. We have a relationship with the holiness of God, and that tells us through the Spirit we... Whether we're doing something wrong, whether we're thinking wrong, it tells us when we're thinking right and doing right. So we have this unique relationship under the new covenant. We don't go to a list of requirements to find out whether um, whether we're doing right or wrong. It's it's almost sounds weird to have to explain that, but young Christians, you know, don't fully grasp that, and uh, because of judaizers and and law keepers that 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 are in the church like the seventh day adventists uh, you know god bless them there's some good christians that are in amongst it that focus on christ that are not so legalistic the seventh day adventists have liberal uh in a sense they're not as conservative and follow alan g white you've got a, a bunch of different types of Christians in the seventh day adventists so i'm not talking about all of them i'm just saying that the 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 fundamentalist uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, are, are more law-centered and law-focused. But having said that, there's not a lot of grace or power of the Spirit. There's not healing that doesn't go on. All the sorts of manifestations of the Spirit doesn't really happen in those churches. And that's because that's where legalism takes you. It takes you away from the Spirit. Um, we So we take every thought captive. That's what you didn't do under the old covenant. We take every thought captive and we start to understand the difference between the flesh and the spirit and we live a life in the spirit, not according to a written code, but according to the spirit which gives life. 
for the spirit gives life but the letter kills and it always has Jesus actually uh, did do what was not lawful on the Sabbath because it actually says in John I think it was John it actually says that he broke the Sabbath but that's not because he was he kept the law perfectly for over 30 years he was bringing in a new covenant which which um, was bringing us into the true Sabbath, which meant that you could do good on the Sabbath. So if you were living a holy life, everything, and you weren't living in sin, you got up in the morning, you did good, you could do good on the Sabbath and still do things that um, were not lawful to do. And uh, Jesus clearly showed that when he traveled and he picked uh, grains of wheat on the Sabbath, uh, he healed on the Sabbath. Um, he did things that were definitely not a law, uh, under the law of Moses weren't allowed. Uh, and he said, I'm the, the Lord of Sabbath. Uh, the law was, the Sabbath was made for me, for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, you know, and, and it even said the priests had special, you know, the priests had special treatment under that. He appealed to the... Um, he appealed to King David when he went in. He went into the ark and ate the bread out of the, behind the holy of holies. And that you would have thought that the the glory of God would have would have absolutely, you know, you would have been knocked down by the glory of God, and and uh, you wouldn't exist anymore because it, what does it say? Um, tradition says that the priests had to have a rope tied to them when they went in there once a year. The high priest put blood in on the mercy seat. If he had sin in his life, he would die instantly. Yet David goes in there and eats the bread. But that's a shadow because, uh, not a shadow, that was a reflection of the grace of God because David was a man that actually lived under the grace of the new covenant, even though he lived, he was a forerunner of the grace of God. He would have been put to death for his deeds under the old covenant, for the murder and the stuff that he did do. But he, he found the grace of God because he, uh, Paul said, David spoke of um, grace and he said, uh, blessed is he whose lawless deeds are not imputed to him. So he didn't have his law. He, he, he was a forerunner of the grace of God, according to Paul. So this would be the reason why he could get away with certain things that were um, definitely unlawful to do. Um, let me go a little bit further. I'll just read that verse out anyway. He said, in Matthew 12, he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered into the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat? Jesus said it wasn't lawful for him to eat, yet he did it. And he didn't suffer the consequences, nor, nor for those who were with him, but only the priests. Have you not read, read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have commanded the guiltless. Oh, sorry, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. There's no extra blessing for keeping a watered down version of the law of Moses, which is what people try to push by saying, Jesus told you to keep the law, so they keep a watered down version, which um, is no version at all. That's like a watered down gospel. If you preach a watered down gospel, it's not the gospel. You can't take away something and change something according to, that it's, uh, according to you so that uh, it seems it suits you better. And think that you're actually keeping it. You know, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And it, and it is a dishonor to what Christ did on the cross and what he accomplished in his perfect work. Every blessing and benefit that is contained in Christ uh, is contained in Christ. And we have the spirit of grace who sanctifies us, separates us, makes us holy. The Bible says that he is our justification. He is our sanctification. He is our righteousness. And it is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. You can't add to what Christ did and go back to some law. I've said this earlier on, but um, I've just got this written down, so I'll read it. You can't add to what Christ did and go back to some law. 
uh, because of transgression. And it was it, this law was given because of transgressions. This law was given to show transgressions. You can't add to the, the perfect work to the cross and go back to a law that was designed for that and think that you're going to get something out of it. It was instituted because of the evil and the wickedness that our Jewish brothers committed. Though the law, through the law was the knowledge of sin, it was brought in to show sin, not to give a blessing. We see in Colossians that we are not to let anyone judge us or to tell us how to live our life when it comes to the Old Testament feasts and the new moons and the festivals and the Sabbaths because Paul clearly says that it is a shadow. Just like the sacrificial system was a shadow of the, little, uh, the literal sacrificial system that was um, brought in through Christ. He was the high priest. He was the lamb. He offered himself up. You know, the old sacrifice has no substance. It had no power uh, to, to actually do what was done under the new covenant. We fulfill the spiritual feasts, okay, of the Passover. This is what the spiritual this is what the feasts mean for us in the new covenant. Keeping the feast won't get you any closer to God, won't make you any more holy, but they were because the feasts were a shadow. We fulfill the spiritual feasts of the Passover when we enter in through the new birth. Jesus was the Jesus uh, was the server up of that new feast. He was the Passover lamb. He was he, that he. So we enter in to the Passover through the new birth, through the blood of Christ. The wrath of God passes over us, right? That's that's entering into that feast. We're living in that feast. And then the, the Feast of Pentecost, we enter into that Feast of Pentecost through the baptism of the Spirit. We are living in that feast. We, we keep those feasts spiritually because that, the, that is the, 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 the reality of those feasts. The feasts were the shadow. Under the New Covenant, we enter into that Feast of Pentecost by experiencing the outpouring of the Pentecost and living filled with the Spirit. In the same way, the, the Sabbath rest, we enter into that rest with God and we experience the Lord of Sabbath. Um, what's coming up now is we have some more feasts coming in the near future. This is the exciting part, which is the Feast of Trumpets, which I believe we're actually in now. This is a feast that some are entering into because what they're doing is they're trumpeting and they're speaking about the message that's coming, which is the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, and the Day of Atonement, which is a time that we're going to enter into these times in this coming uh, season, or in, you say in this season or in the next season that we're going to be experiencing on the earth, we will fulfill all the feasts in a spiritual way. The Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, we are yet to enter into this last two feasts. But we are in the Feast of Trumpets now, and um, this is the message that's being trumpeted out, but there's a day coming and that's called the Day of Atonement, when the church will enter into the glory of the Holy of Holies. And as the high priest did it, did in the shadow, they, that was the shadow, what the high priest did. We, we, we will get cleansed up and cleaned and purified, and then we, the church, you could say the remnant church, but the church will enter in to the glory realm. We will be mantled with fresh glory that we haven't seen as a church. Prophets and certain people taste this glory. You'll see, you'll see these sorts of things in the, uh, in the Bible. Um, but the church itself is going to mature up. You could say the remnant church, but it's going to be a big remnant. And we, after we've fulfilled the Feast of Passover. We've fulfilled the Pentecost. We're in the Feast of Trumpets. And then the next one is the, the Feast, the Day of Atonement. This is going to be the most special day. That it's mo the most important holy day of the year under the old covenant in the shadow and it's going to be the most important day for the church under the new spiritual covenant uh, covenant when we enter into this glory realm this is going to be all grace too we're going to this is going to blow our minds um, so we shouldn't confuse the shadows and the pictures of the old testament with the real spiritual fulfillment um, what have we got 47 minutes i might cut this uh, I might cut this off soon and I'll probably end up doing another one um, in the next few days. But let me just read Galatians 2.11 because when we talk about um, what Gentiles are required to do, 
and what Jews were, you know, required to do. What grace did the Jew have? What grace did the Gentile have? In Galatians 2.11, when Cephas came to Antioch, however, I opposed him to his face. This is Paul speaking. Because he stood to be condemned. I have to en uh, emphasize that. Peter stood to be condemned. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James. These are the Judaizers. These were the Jewish people that were pushing the law. This is the reason why they wrote the, um, the letter in the book of Acts and they had that first council was to deal with men that came from James that started to say that, um, that the apostles are requiring that you actually fulfill the law of Moses. Now that you're a Christian, you've got to go back, you've got to come in and start you know, getting circumcised and you've got to keep the law. You basically got to come Jewish proselytes uh, to, to, to be accepted by God, which is, which is a lie. They, uh, the apostles said, we did not send them to say this. We did not say this. And in the book of Acts says, Gentiles are not required to, to get circumcised or to follow any of that law except um, keeping them from things strangled, things sacrificed, two idols obviously keep from idolatry and sexual immorality and he said if you do this as a gentile you will do well and that's the difference people say no you won't do well if you just do those things you've got to keep dietary requirements you've got to keep the sabbath to do well that's completely contrary to the apostolic doctrine that we have in the bible uh, and so when we reject the apostles doctrine and 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 go to the shadows of the old covenant we are messing with a curse and we're bringing ourselves under condemnation if we don't wake up to ourselves and start to come back into the grace of god let me get back to this verse 12 says for before certain men came from james he used to eat with the gentiles that means peter wasn't keeping the dietary requirements he knew the grace of god he knew he had the vision when it said the Gentiles became clean. And so obviously he's assumed that, well, if they're clean, then whatever they're doing can't be defiling them. If God's declared the Gentiles clean, then their foods must be clean. And that's what Paul said. He, Paul said, all things are clean. All meats are clean. All foods are clean. There's nothing unclean or evil of itself. He said, "If it's it, and it's to be sanctified and received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. That's the words of the Apostle Paul. Let me carry on in verse 12. But when they arrived, which are the Judaizers, he began to draw back and separate himself. So he, he was doing the right thing, Paul's saying, and now he's drawn back and separated himself for fear of the circumcision group. Okay. We clearly see the Apostle Paul rebuking Peter when he went to Antioch because Peter was actually not living under the Jewish law but was eating with the Gentiles and ministering to them. And then he did a backflip when the men came from that group, which he calls the circumcision. You know, And he even, if we, we go a bit further in that verse, but you can look at that yourself. Go through Galatians, it's pretty clear. He even started to teach the Gentiles to live as Jews. And that's what Paul said. Why do you teach, if you've gone through and, you know, you were living like the Gentiles, why are you now telling the Gentiles to live as, as Jews? You were just eating with them not long ago. Uh, so Paul said he stood condemned for that act. And Paul felt under obligation to pull Peter up for that. And uh, you've got to admit, when you read Peter's letters, he said that Paul's writings are, you know, some of his stuff is hard to understand, which the unstable and the unlearned twist like they do the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. Paul said, uh, Peter basically put Paul's letters and Paul's teachings up on the level with Scripture back in those days. And I think um, Paul probably put his letters up there with Scripture too because he said, the gospel I received didn't come from me, it's from God. And for them, the gospel was, was scripture. It was new revelation. Peter was accepting of that. He, just, um, he was just dealing with religious people, which brings fear. When you're dealing with true religious religiosity and Judaizers, they bring, they bring, there's, there's spirits of murder that are connected to some of these uh, religious um, movements. 
you have to watch out. It's, there's a spirit behind it. Paul said that. Paul said to the church, did he say it, Galatians or Corinthians? He said, you can receive another spirit and there is another Jesus. And he was saying, you can receive that spirit on top of your uh, new birth and the, and the baptism of the spirit that you've already received from Christ. So there's warnings for Christians to not receive uh, a demonic spirit that was involved in legalism. Uh, you know, Paul was completely against the t this teaching. And uh, all through the letters of Galatians and Romans, we see Paul taught against the Gentiles having to become Jews or follow Jewish precepts and laws to please God. You know, going into the Old Testament law of commandments, and bringing them in and applying them to, to the Gentile church, we see was actually forbidden in the book of Acts, which is what I just mentioned before, by the apostolic council. So it doesn't, doing that doesn't bolster any type of new covenant law. When the apostles taught against doing that, you saying that you should be doing it to receive another blessing is not bolstering the new covenant. You're, you're, uh, you're basically mixing and poisoning the new covenant with the old, uh, with the old covenant, which brought curse. Um, so it's not doing any, it's not bringing any blessing in any way, shape or form. And most of the previous quotes are from the Old Testament. This is part of the debate. I'll, um, I'll just skip over that. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of the times we see Jesus using the Old Covenant, uh, the, old, the, law, the law of Moses lawfully to bring the Jews under conviction. Um, yeah. Romans 14, 14 says, I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ, ministers to Christ in these things, is acceptable to God and approved by him. See, we see in Romans, Paul was dealing about uh, dealing with um, foods. Some people, you know, thought that you couldn't eat meat that was in Rome at all and this is unclean food this is this is not jewish kosher food paul was dealing with um gentile converts who who gone vegetarian who who wouldn't eat any of the meat because they thought well how do we know whether it's been sacrificed to idols or not we're not even going to eat meat now so they become afraid of eating meat and they ate uh just vegetables paul called them weak in face faith he said nothing's unclean of itself but then he goes on to say you know if you go to a meat market don't ask any questions just pray over it, sanctify it. You're not eating, it, you know, but if someone tells you that this has been sacrificed to an idol, don't eat it, you know, for your conscience and for the other person's sake, um, because eating food that, you know, has been sacrificed to idols is no good. But Paul said there's still nothing unclean of itself. An idol is neither anything. Uh, so Paul had a pretty strong revelation that you could eat and this has got nothing to do with kosher food. This is just Gentiles eating Gentile food that was sold at a meat market in Rome. I mean, Paul didn't go and say, you know what, you guys at Rome need to go back to, to Israel and get kosher food. He didn't say that at all. Okay, so that's another indication that, they're, they're, that kosher food was not required for Gentiles because Paul would have clearly said here that, you know, give up eating gentile meat he didn't say that he said actually if you do give up eating gentile meat you're actually weak in faith but don't go judging people who want to do that who want to eat vegetables we shouldn't judge one another you're free to to to, to eat bacon or you're free to abstain from bacon if you want to eat prawns and crabs eat them if you don't want to eat them then don't eat them just don't judge one another and look down on one another but one thing you don't do is you don't teach it. When you start to teach things, you brought yourself under another level. The Bible says that you, not many of us should be teachers knowing that we shall receive stricter judgment. This type of thing will bring you under stricter judgment because if you're teaching something that's false and you're bringing in 
old covenant teachings into the new covenant, you're bringing yourself under judgment. The Lord will deal with you without a doubt. He, he, he's, he, as a matter of fact, he won't let you do this forever. He will, um, he will do something pretty drastically to stop you from doing that. That's um, what James said. He said, we will be brought under stricter judgment. So uh, it's a, it's not a, it's not actually a joke. Even though I do, um, I find it a bit funny that we have to deal with this under, you know, as New Covenant Christians. I find it funny or just strange that we talk, have to talk about this. But like I said, there are people that want to push the old law, and so it has to be talked about, and we have to understand why it's why it's all about grace. God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness. It's about us fulfilling the law through the Spirit, loving our neighbor as ourself, and loving God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. Paul said, if you do this, you fulfill all the laws. And he didn't say you're filling dietary requirements. He said that's what the law was really about. The dietary requirements and most a lot of the other 613 Jewish laws were identity laws, cultural laws. Um, and so... We are of the covenant of the new of, of the spirit, the new covenant of the spirit, uh, not of the letter, not of the law. The grace of God and the law of the spirit, which is the law of the new covenant, is never an excuse to sin. So when I emphasize the grace of God and the new covenant, this has got nothing to do with allowing people to sin more because you're not under the old covenant law of Moses it's actually the opposite it's actually you don't have an excuse to sin now because God's holiness lives in you you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit God gives you a, an awareness of what the flesh and, the, and, and holiness is so you actually got less chance of sinning well, I don't like using the word chance but you've got no excuse because the holiness of God Christ lives in you now and he's trying to live his life through you through that new man which has been created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, the law of the Spirit becomes the catalyst and the means of power so that we may not sin. So anyone that says the grace of God, you know, means that new covenant means that you can commit sin, they've, they've either got no understanding of what grace is, they're either immature and have no understanding and probably should not say anything, keep their mouth closed instead of verbalizing false teaching like that, or they're not Christians at all. Because a Christian that has met God through the grace of God wouldn't say anything like that. Most of the time, they wouldn't. <laughs> we now have no excuses for committing sin and living as a slave to sin. We've been set free from sin. Shall we commit sin that grace may abound? Paul said, as some have accused that we say that. He says, Shall we live in sin now? So that... So that through living in sin that the grace of God might be manifest more? Paul's like, no, I didn't say that. No, we got no excuses to sin. How can someone who's dead to sin and died actually live in sin? That's what the grace does. It kills the old man and gives us a new man so that we live a life of grace through the Christ in us. It is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. Anyone that uses the grace for an excuse to sin, uh, I just mentioned this already. You know, grace gives the power to walk as Christ walked and the patience of God to mold us and form us and refine us through two types of fire. One fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire, and the fire comes in and cleanses you and burns out some of the old nature. And the other fire is the fire of trials. When we go through fiery trials, um, that acts as a cleansing fire of the old character. That fiery trial teaches us, like Paul said, that you know he was went through trials and he was afraid to the point of death. He said, "We, you know, there were fears within, there were fears without," and he said, "But what we learnt was not to trust in ourselves because we we thought we were going to die." So God sometimes takes us to places where we lose all trust in ourselves, all trust in man, and it's a fiery trial that we don't enjoy at the time. But in the end, we come out the other end trustworthy, more trusting of God. Looking back, thinking, oh, how we really didn't trust God that much. We, we were secure in our bank account. We were secure in our job. We were secure in family. You know, 
it's hard to go through that fiery that type of fiery trial it's a lot nicer getting baptized in the fire of the holy spirit and having that cleanse out uh, nature but it's two fires that god uses um i think i'm going to hold it up there guys we've done an hour now you got the uh you, i suppose you've got the point of of, of, of this message now about um, not moving back into the law and uh, seeking to be uh, justified, declared righteous or to get any extra right standing in God through keeping the old law, through dietary requirements, for growing your beard, for trying to look like a Jew, trying to keep the feasts. You're not going to get anything extra doing that. If you want to do it, do it. Don't teach people to do it. I'm going to pull it up there. We've done an hour and... Uh, I've still got quite a bit more that I wanted to read here, so I probably will do another video, but that'll be it for today. And, uh, you know, God bless you all over in Pakistan, and may the Holy Spirit um, be poured out in that land and, and in Africa. Uh, you know, Father, I ask for you to bless our brothers over in Africa and Pakistan, and bless our brothers here in Cairns in North Queensland. Father, we wait for your presence of your spirit to come upon us in a greater and deeper way. We await for the the uh, the spiritual feast of the Day of Atonement to be fulfilled. Father, we ask for you to prepare our hearts for this day and um, pour out the spirit of intercession on us, Father, that we may intercede with your heart, that we may experience your love for, for sinners and your love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, yes, Lord, just more and more of your spirit, Father. Help us to fast and pray. Help us to have quiet time that we may seek your face and experience more and more of your grace. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, you have a blessed day and I will talk to you again soon. See ya.